welcome. Could you all, could you all come forward? Come closer, come closer, please. Does everybody have a drink? Yes. Yes. A uh, lady with, in the blue with the long hair. Okay, thank you. So, welcome to Web Wednesday. This is our 87th Web Wednesday. Uh, we've been going for eight years. We are the uh, very young granddad of the internet in Hong Kong. So, uh, I want to start off first by asking you all to give some money to Oxfam. You already have, if you paid hundred dollars at the door, ten dollars is going to Oxfam. And the reason we're doing that is that uh, our cousins across the border in Yunnan are suffering from earthquake disease. So if you've got extra cash, you can always go to Oxfam Hong Kong's website and give some extra money. They're sending all kinds of blankets and pillows and things like that. So let me thank first Adam. Adam, this gentleman is the owner of this lovely nightclub. Hello, Adam. I'd like to thank you everybody coming over here. And uh, this is under, under, under renovation of a party under the rent of Shabby. We're very sorry to call some of the meetings you're going to call with the lighting system tonight. I hope it can fix it tonight. Rest I wish you all the best for tonight's event. Thank you very much. And uh, Adam has told me earlier that he's going to be auctioning, auctioning these red uh, sofas. So you lot, yeah? If you like how it feels, come up to Adam later and give him $5,000 and he might give you one part of that sofa. <laughs> wow, feedback. So um, all the sofas down the side here and at the back are being sold, right, Adam? Adam? Yes. How about the lips? Are the lips for sale? No, are you sure? Going once, going twice? No, no, no lips. Normally the lips have a video screen, and I was really looking forward to having some kind of Uber video protruding from the lips, but we can't do that tonight. So you're just gonna have to imagine it happening. So if you get bored during the interview, just look at the lips and think about Uber. Um, so, I just want to thank also the guys from Radio Chinwag. Where's Lee? Lee, come on, Lee, Lee, Lee. Radio Chinwag, Lee and Ron, they are doing a lot of interesting stuff with sound, education, all kinds of things. They take this event, they record it, and we put it up on SoundCloud. So if you want to listen to all the past interviews, go to soundcloud.com slash web. Wins. Right? And thanks to Lee, makes it sound good. Thanks, Lee. And Bronny, where's Bronny? Bronny. Bronny.com, in the flesh. Uh, his photographs go up on Flickr, so we'll put those up on Flickr later. So you can see yourselves. You don't need selfies here, just rely on Bronny. Right? And finally, I just want to say, um, who else do I want to thank? I know who I want to thank. I want to thank, you might have noticed at the door, there was a rather attractive young lady, Annette. She's come all the way from the Philippines. She wants to work in marketing in Hong Kong. So if you want to give somebody a job, a smart young thing, talk to her on the way out, right? And finally, the next uh, Web Wednesday will be here on August, no, not August, September the 17th with Yong BB, which is a, a travel site in Shenzhen that's just been sold to Skyscanner. So we'll be talking travel. So let's, let's get started. We've got a, a little commercial interruption. Who in the room is a coder? Put your hand up. Who's a programmer? One, two, three, four. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Five. Who's a designer? Designer. No designers? One. One designer. Okay, so. Uh, on the August 17th, sorry, 16th and 17th, there is going to be a hackathon in Hong Kong for coders to develop something for charity. So we've got a few words about this. Where's the man behind it? Not you, Simon. <laughs> Go ahead. It could be Simon. 
All right, excuse me, just to be polite, could we have a little bit of silence? Shh. Go on. You have plenty of time to talk later. Shh. Thank you. Is that Hey, everybody. My name is Derek. Uh, just real quick, I wanted to make a shout out. The hackathon coming up on August 16th to 17th. It's going to be 24 hours, and what we're doing is getting together to help local charities create new web presences and or creating new apps that will help the nonprofit sector here. Uh, there's two tracks. One, we will be helping out Kirsten Zoo, which is a local dog and cat rescue. And they need a lot of help with their website, trying to get their digital presence uh, a little bit more updated. Uh, and then the other track is going to be creative, you know, open to you to de uh, develop whatever you'd like. Uh, both of those will be eligible for some pretty sweet prizes. Uh, we've got one month of office space dedicated, uh, or sorry, hot desk from Paperclip, as well as we have a uh, Parrot AR Drum 2 dedicated from Nest, and we also have, oh, what's the last one here, a GoPro from General Assembly. Um, so we really think that we can help the smaller charities get a lot more advanced with their tech. Uh, if you're a designer or a developer, stop on by, it's 100 bucks, you get four free meals with that, so that's pretty dang cheap for Hong Kong. The website is code, and then the number four, goodhk.com, and it's August 16th. Where? Where is it going to be? Uh, it's going to be in Shawan, so you don't have to travel too far if you're on the island. Uh, it's the uh, 16th floor on Bonham Strand, it's in the Nest uh, headquarters. So we'll have uh, pizza, Wi-Fi, and a good time. Will the sign will be there? No. Ah, okay. I'm going to recruit this, right? And no recruiters. Thank you. So, so an open environment. Spread the word. Code for good. Thank you. Round of applause. Good, good effort, man. Thank you. Right. The moment you've been waiting for. I'm not going to do a dance scene. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, Sam. Uh, before Sam comes on stage, I want to know how many of you came here tonight using Uber? Sam, Sam, you've got some business. <laughs> How many of you haven't used Uber? That's about 70%. How many of you have used Uber and have had a good experience? How many of you have used Uber and have had a bad experience? Three. Only three, man. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Have you brought tomatoes with you? Rotten tomatoes? No. Difficult questions. Anyway, Sam, Sam has been appearing all over town, and I was lucky enough to grab him to come here. He was going to appear in the Hot Lips, but he's not. He's going to come on stage. So a round of applause for Sam, please. Come on. Thank you. Do you want a drink? I got it there. But I'll Sam's a bit nervous. He's drinking water. So let, let's be really nice to him. Right? Um, so, what, what is your job? Your, your, head, your title is Head of Expansion. Is, is, it, is it Head of Expansion or Head of Growth? Well, right now I'm running the Hong Kong market. But I spent the past two and a half years uh, first doing Europe expansion. So I ran the London launch, the Amsterdam launch. Uh, and then the past year and a half I've run our expansion in Asia. So you, you, were, you were in, where's the headquarters? Uh, San Francisco. So they go, right, who wants to go to Europe? I was and you were the only guy who put your hand up. Something like that. Uh, who wants to go international? It's more the American terminology. Yeah, when I got to Uber, we were in four cities, and they were all in the U.S. So I was the first international uh, hire for Uber. Uh, and they sent me straight to London. So I never made it to San Francisco. Had you been to London before? I had. Yeah, I, I had, but never in the capacity of building a business there. So you, you, you see Uber take off in the States, and you go to London. And you, you arrive in London and you, you encounter the black cab. You encounter Halo. You encounter all these other guys. They were all there, yeah. They were all there. So how, how, do you, how does an American company crack London? I think they send a good looking young American? Is one, one, one well, way. I find a good looking British person. And when I found her, the whole business took off. And that actually is a true story. Uh, it was, was, she, was she related to the Queen? She wasn't, no. Uh, um, not blue blood. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were young then. We were there right before the Olympics. And, uh, I, yeah, we offered a slightly different product. It was a Mercedes S-Class. Yeah, it was a different feel than a, than, than a black hat. But it took a little while. And it was hiring really, really good local people that made us feel like we were British. Uh, or at least an American company that, that was making itself British. And that 
That was a, a game changer. It was really about finding the right So you, you were leveraging the build-up to the Olympics, right? It was all about all these people coming to town, the Olympics is around the corner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Olympics helped, but it didn't help nearly as much as good hires. Okay. So how long did it take to get a business off the ground in London? Yeah, London was, was crazy. It, you know, it took... It, 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 I think the, the experience I've had running the different expansions has been the same everywhere, which is we go places, the, the service, you know, it starts, it's a trial period, and then newspapers write stories about how Uber only works in San Francisco, but it doesn't work in New York. Uh, and <laughs> Have they started doing that in Hong Kong yet? Oh yeah, yeah, they've done it here Sorry, too. just a commercial interruption. Could you, excuse me, you lot speaking, just for the benefit of those who want to listen, could you be quiet for 45 minutes? Please? If you don't want to listen, uh, go and sit by the lips over there. Alright, please, it, it's polite and it's nice. Thank you. Sorry. Anyways, yeah. So I, I think there's, there, and that definitely happened in London. You know, as everyone said, this is a great San Francisco concept. It's a great New York concept, but it won't work here. Uh, and, and we got it in Singapore too. It's a great London concept. It's a great San Francisco concept, but not Asia. And you know, SCMP wrote a similar story here already. So it's there, there's a great. What do they say? It, it works in 143 other cities. So we're just, not just that guy, yeah. We, you know, it happens a lot, um, but I think, uh, and that certainly happened in London. London's a massive city. Uh, there are a ton of transportation choices. Uh, so it took us a while, but you know, it, like I said, it's, it's hiring good people. Um, and there's something about the brand now. There's something about Uber where, even when I got to London, you have Americans who are there, and they can get you started. So you get that jump start going, and then slowly the local markets start to catch on. Uh, when I ran Shanghai, we started out, we were 80% uh, people who had English as their iPhone language taking rides for the first three months. Uh, and now that's flipped, where 80% of our rides in Shanghai uh, are people of English, or who have Chinese as their iPhone language. So, so what about in Hong Kong, similar, similar concept? Are you going to all the uh, American Chinese and saying, yo man, yo, just yo, what about Uber, yo? Yeah, I mean, are you yoing or Ubering? You can buy yo, I can see it worked really well. Are you well. talking about our Chinese name? Yeah, you, no, you, no, 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 yo. Oh, okay, got it. Because yeah. the first character in our Chinese name was yo as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, now here it's been, I mean here, we, we, it's hard to put enough cars in for all the demand that is in Hong Kong. This is the uh, fastest growing city we've ever had in history. Um, that really surprises me because yeah. I, I was going to take an Uber ride to get here tonight, mm -hmm. but I, I went, fuck it, and I got inside a tram. Okay. Because I want <laughs> You know, I, I was a bit worried how many people were going to turn out. Fair enough. I wanted to feel the wind in my hair and you know, well, I think you could have got one. <laughs> no one here took a, took a ride here, and that's that's good. It was kind of funny. I was I was at a, a dinner uh, with a bunch of investors because I used to be in the investment industry, and they were asking. They said, well, "What are you going to do when you get to saturation? And, and are, are you guys there yet?" And I asked who at the table. There were nine investors in the investment industry here have, have ever taken a ride with Uber. Not a single one of them had. Um, and that's not because they all have private drivers, they're investors, yeah. right? They have private cars. But, but private drivers are, are good for Uber. People are private drivers. Private drivers can't take you and your wife somewhere at the same time. They, they drivers sleep. Uh, India is one of our fastest growing countries in history. Uh, because places... And a lot of drivers sleep in India. Uh, apparently they yeah. do. But I see that as a place where everyone has a private driver and still our business is completely taking off. So let's just go back to London, because I thought it was quite interesting. I took my first experience of Uber was in London, okay. and the guy wouldn't stop talking. He took me to the airport, and he was so excited about the fact he was making so much money. He was like, you know, I used to be a private cabbie, and I was doing there and I wait for calls, and yeah, a bit like Hong Kong, you know, five telephones and all that. He says, now I make like three times as much money, and it's great. I can. You know, I can talk to you. I'm from Afghanistan. I heard the whole life story. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, but he was making money. So I, I, I saw recently that in New York, your drivers make between 75000 and 100000 a year, US dollars. Was that some PR or is that just trying to keep, you know, the mayor of New York happy? I, I, I was not doing that data analysis, so I, I can't say one or the other, but you know, we are creating a ton of jobs and, and drivers make a lot of money on Uber, that's for sure. So, so let's get back, so you're in London, you get London off the ground. How long did it take to get it to like a, a good, solid business that you could then go, fine, I'm out of here? There were, there were a couple things. I mean, it, again, I, I, I said that kind of flippantly, but we did make some really, really good hires that just, you know, 
we made one hire, and next thing we knew, the entire Chelsea team was riding uh, Uber. You know, and it wasn't, whereas if I would have gone as some foreigner and I would have asked a Chelsea player, they would have charged me 10,000 pounds. So was it a Russian that you hired? <laughs> it was, uh, it's not a Russian, but... It was a Russian. Uh, if you want Chelsea, you hire a Russian. That's how I want to see it. Yeah, apparently, but you know, this girl, her... Yeah, she was just connected to everyone, so she was just getting everyone riding, and suddenly Uber became cool in London. And I, I can show the chart of exactly when we hired her. It was really, really pretty incredible. So it wasn't the Olympics. This was before the Olympics. It was after the Olympics. Yeah, the Olympics was like a little. I mean, London's history is kind of like boom and then boom and then now. It's, now, now it's so, so uh, when the cabs went on strike in London, I, I was yeah. in London about a month ago, okay. and all my mates said, "It's brilliant. I'm using this thing called Uber." I didn't know about it until the black cats went on strike. Yeah. So is this is this part of your strategy? You go in there, you whip up some fervor amongst the taxi guys. They go on strike. People go. Yeah, we went fun, my fun, my fun, and then they jumped. We went from 160 to two uh, in the app store in one week. Uh, when 160 to two. From when they called strike. For all of the UK, we were the number two app. Uh, I think behind Skype or something like that. Yeah. So it just shows protest works, right? Yeah, it's... I mean, so what are you doing for Occupy Central? Are you providing free drivers to Occupy... We, we have to pick that out. That'll be good. So, so let's get back to Hong Kong. So you're in Hong Kong, so you've done London. Yeah. And then where do you go to from London? Singapore? Well, I did Amsterdam and then Singapore. Then what China. a terrible job. London, Amsterdam. Yeah. So what, what, what took you over the hill? What was the tipping point of Amsterdam? What got us there in Amsterdam? Yeah. Um, they all use bicycles, don't they? They all use bicycles. I mean, it's a $600 million cab industry in, in Amsterdam. I mean, London is something like $10 billion. So it's a smaller market. But again, good hires helped. Uh, you know, actually, I don't really remember if there was a real tipping point there. I think that was just more of a gradual, a gradual business. But it's, a, it's an easy city. You know, you put three cars on the road and you can be anywhere in 10 minutes. So it's, it's not as costly to do it. So you go to London, Amsterdam, and you go, okay, I'm tired of Europe. I want to go to Asia. Yeah. What's the first city in Asia? We went to Singapore. Okay. Yeah. Is that because the Singaporean government gave you a tax break? Uh, no, I, I, we had some investors who had a really good experience in Singapore, and they okay. said, go to Singapore first. And I, I've been living in Hong Kong since 2006. Okay. So I, I wanted to come here, but we decided to do Singapore first. And so you were up against Grab Taxi and these kind of guys, were you or not really? They weren't there yet. When we got there, uh, probably the closest thing that there was to competition was you know, Comfort had an app you could use to book a taxi. And everybody knows in Singapore there's queues and queues of people very frustrated. As soon as it rains, prices go up 25%, right? So yeah. they already understand the surge pricing that you guys did. You, yeah. Did you launch your surge pricing in, in Singapore? We, we use dynamic pricing pretty quickly. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Dynamic pricing. Surge pricing. Can you explain, explain how that works? Uh, sure. You know, when, when most of our cars are taken up, then we raise the prices. And it so can that's be a anywhere. demand and supply thing, right? Demand and supply. It can be anywhere from like a 25% premium to 3 to 4x. Yeah, I had experts in London. I was going to a pub to have lunch. 12 yeah. o'clock, 37 quid to get to Heathrow. All right. 12.37, 67 quid to get to Heathrow. Yeah. Not that so I had a few beers, so I went for the 67 quid. Fair enough. We've seen, we've seen a lot worse. We've seen a lot worse. Yeah. So tell us, so, so you've done Singapore. What, what was the cultural difference you saw from, because there's a big cultural leap from the US, San Francisco to London. London, uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Singapore. What, what, what did you see that was different in the behavior? Because it seems to me Uber's, unlike most American firms, you guys seem quite flexible to adjust your business model to each market, right? Yeah, I, I think that you know, every city has different pain points. And every city has different places where Uber can help out. But what's amazed me running this business in China, uh, in the UK, in Hong Kong, and in Amsterdam is much more how similar places are. Uh, you know, people, the complaints we get from riders in China are identical to the complaints we got in London. Driver wasn't safe. Driver didn't have water. Driver didn't open the door. Uh, the complaints from drivers are the exact same. So I think what, when you look at our business, the key drivers of what people want. People want safety, they want reliability, and they want a comfortable ride, and they prefer cheaper than more expensive. And drivers want to make more money. And you know that hasn't been different for a single city that we've been in. I think you, you hire local teams who know how to get your message across. Uh, and we're very, very diligent about making sure our teams know how to localize our message and who we are. But the core experience is the same in, you know, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. 
But, but isn't the isn't the argument that it's just easier because you can do it for an app and you can pay for an app and all that? Is it sounds from what you just said, nothing had to do with the fact it was an app or it was convenient to pay. Are those all kind of secondary? S safe, reliable, comfortable, convenient. I guess the reliable part. Safe, the, reliable, comfortable, the, convenient. The comfortable, convenient, convenient. The uh, I think the safety. I mean, every ride you take, you get a receipt in the mail that shows exactly where you've gone. So if you land in Kuala Lumpur and your driver, a taxi, takes you for a roundabout route and you're in an Uber car instead, you know, we look at the receipt, we see exactly where you went, and then we give you the fare you should have paid. Uh, every ride you take is with a driver. That's a nice selling point. So I, is your first, is your primary audience the, the kind of road warrior types that are going from city to city and they start to use you in London and they go, okay, I'm on a business trip, I'll use them in Amsterdam, I'm going to Singapore. Is that, is that your early adopters? No, yeah, it's becoming, a, it's becoming a really, really nice selling point for Uber that everywhere you go, you have this very consistent, safe experience. Uh, you know, the people, I'm running Hong Kong right now, and I prefer people who live in Hong Kong to be using Uber, because they're the ones who are going to continue to use Uber from Uber. But your job is quite difficult, because you've got to get uh, the cars, the drivers, and the consumers. So you've got two very different markets to approach, right? Yeah. So how, yeah. how, do you, how do you persuade a driver? Is it very simple? It's like, do you want to double your income? Well, I think every driver, I mean, the guy, like the guys in London, for example, you know, they, they have a huge developed market before Uber got there, but it's incredibly political. So every driver, uh, there, there's a dispatcher who gives out dispatches, and you have to pay them off, and there's this huge world around it. There are like 30,000 drivers, and they're in this constant political battle. Uh, and then Uber comes in, and we say, the driver who's closest is going to get the trip. Uh, and these guys loved it. You know, we removed this entire pain point from their life. We took out this aspect of their life they hated and just made the technology do it. And if you guys... So you're saying until then it wasn't to do with closeness, it was to do with how much hurrying his favors. Yeah. It was like... You had to pay some guy to get the airport trips. And yeah. with us, if driver... You know, Are you Uber, telling that England's corrupt? Well, the, the, the pre... London is corrupt. The pre-Uber minicab market definitely <laughs> yeah. You know, and now, you know, and now if, if, if riders like you, if your rating's above 4.5 stars, uh, and you're the closest guy, you're gonna get that trip. And the drivers have flooded to us. And, you know, and so getting drivers is not a challenge. As long as you're making the money, it's not, no. I mean, they need to be making money. And I, I think that's the side of Uber that I think we don't, we should be talking about more, is, and you've talked about it nicely a lot, is that, you know, we're giving so many drivers this opportunity to make money whenever they want. So do you, do you, because of the ease of payment, you collect the money for them and you just pay it into their accounts? Yeah, one, every week. So every that, week. And this is another, you know, it's an industry, the limo industry can be pretty dodgy, right? So this is an industry where pre-Uber, you would do a job and then maybe you'd get paid six weeks later. And with Uber... Not long, you'd wait six weeks. All the time. And, and that's true in every city, you know, that's true in Shanghai and that's true in Dubai. And now, with Uber, every Tuesday, the money hits your account. And if it's but then, as far as I understand, from all the movies I've seen from Hollywood, all of the movie, all of the cab companies run by triads, gangsters, Russians, yeah. <laughs> Macau gamblers. So, is, it, is, there a, is there a price on your head? Uh, How much is it? I've never had anything. <laughs> we have a security team now at Uber, but I've never had anything oh, right. to do with them. So, or, tell or, us a little bit about, about Uber, because I've seen you know, I did some research and I saw that you have, you have, you're starting to launch different products, right? There's Uber and there's Uber X. Uh, so tell us how it works because I'm a bit confused to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, when we come to a city, it's generally a pretty high end product. And that's what we have here. I think one thing that we found all over the world is that a low cost product, an accessible product, you know, if there's one thing that changes the game, it's price. Uh, so in, in London, you know, I said that when we hired this, this woman, our, our revenues really moved up, and that was nice, and that was like this. When we offered a product that was a 40% discount to taxis, uh, you know, I, we must have gone, we must have tripled in three months. Um, and in order to do that, were you losing money? I think what we realized is that so many consumers wanted this product, that drivers were doing so many trips per hour. Yeah. And if you get more consumers, you get more drivers. And as you get more drivers, then your arrival times become, instead of 10 minutes, they become two minutes. Oh, and then consumers use you more and more, and drivers have to be on the platform. Because that's how they're making, and then they're doing two, three trips per hour. And it's this virtual circle. You've lived in Hong Kong since uh, 2006, right? Yeah. I've been here since 93. It's a long time. It's a long time. <laughs> but the public transport hasn't changed. 
Yeah. You can still stop on the side of the street, wave down a, a rather shaky bus, mm -hmm. get inside in a minibus, and they will drive you 90 miles an hour, <laughs> and then they'll stop suddenly and spit somebody out, right? Sure. Or you can get on a tram for two dollars forty. It yeah. used to be twenty cents when I first. <laughs> yeah. Or you can, you know, take a very nicely air conditioned underground yeah. or MTR. Yeah. So and, and there are people who have drivers. Yeah. Right. You can hire a Filipino or whatever somebody to be a driver for you. Yeah. For you know, in a, in a section of a banking salary. <laughs> So how, how do you guys play in that? In that, it's very crowded. It's really interesting to see how you come into that because people who with money have drivers, people who don't will take a mini bus. Mm -hmm. So how do you come into that? I'm curious. I think the biggest mistake people have when they think about where Uber doesn't have a place is thinking that Uber needs to get every single tram rider in order for us to do well. You know, the the public transportation market in Hong Kong is over seven billion dollars. Right? So if we get one out of every thousand journeys that happen, we have probably a nine-figure business. Um, so I think that's a, one of the first things, is we, Uber brings a choice to cities, and we bring this new option, and it's not about making people not use the tram. The tram's always going to be there, and the taxis are always going to be there. But what people, it's amazing the selective memory. Everywhere I go, I see cab queues. Yeah, I think Kenneth might be here. We cannot put enough cars on the road on a Friday night to satisfy all the need there is for people who just want to get home. And yes, you can get a tram on Queens Road, but to get from the IFC to your house in the mid-levels on a Friday yeah, at 7 p.m. Yeah, but taking a terrible. tram when you're slightly drunk at like 11 is not a good idea, nor is a minibus. Yeah. Or even a taxi, because you end up, you know, roller coastering back to your house. It's true, but it's 8 a.m. on Conduit Road that we have more demand than we know what to do with it. It's, it's people who are in Chongwan at 7 p.m. trying to get home, and that's where our demand is. This is like, it is just really bread and butter. And, and I think, you know, Uber makes, you know, the problem with the taxi industry is that the taxi industry is really, really overpriced most of the day, and it's super underpriced during peak hours. You know, and that's what Uber does, is we come in and Except we create Except in Singapore, they have a, like, it, there's a surcharge, right, after 11 or, being Singaporean, if you go to the ERP or if you go within the city center, it's more or if you... Yeah, but you know, so, so prices go from like $10 to $12, but you could probably send prices to 25 before you actually got the people who needed rides, their rides. So let's talk a bit about, so that there's Uber, there's Uber X. What is Uber X? Is that like it's just a naughty version of Uber? It, it's kind of a, it, it has a lot of different definitions, but the, I think the standard thing is it's, it's the low cost Uber. Yeah, so in London, you know, we were always Mercedes S classes, and then we said, how about we put Toyota Camrys out there and charge half the price? Uh, and that was a game changer. So in, in Hong Kong, the rumor is you're about to bring 20 Teslas into Hong Kong. Wow, I haven't heard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, this, this comes from very informed sources. Yeah. <laughs> they said that um, because you're lacking cars and you've just raised 1.2 billion, why not buy 20 Teslas? Yeah. Well, how, and, and you're bringing these to Hong Kong. So is this is this how you see? You know, is it is it about bringing, you know, new new ideas, new vehicles to this town? I mean, this town's had electric cars for a while. You can plug in various places. Yeah. But you know, it's the taxis are still using LPG. Yeah. Uber doesn't own a car anywhere in the world, and we're not going to own a car in Hong Kong. So anyone who's like, a mate of yours is bringing up like, twenty taxi, twenty Teslas. Tell that person to email me because I'd, I'd love I'd love to hear more. Uh, but no, Uber has no plan to buy cars. So, so I've seen that now. Uber has started to do things like you know, in Beijing, this kind of, actually it's a spin-off of what's happening in the States, right? So in San Francisco, you've got a, a kind of innovation lab, right, called Garage. The Garage, yeah. Oh, sorry, Garage. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. Actually, that's the, correct, that's the correct pronunciation. I don't know. I mean, no, it is. It is. Yeah. So, the in the boot, yeah, yeah. In the trunk. So you've got a garage. <laughs> what happens in the garage? I, I just know it as a place you go dancing when I was younger. Well, I think that there's, you know, it's Uber has. When I first got to Uber, I was, you know, I was the 35th employee, and we were just Are you rich. Right now, I'm not at all. Not okay. Right? On paper, I don't even know. But yeah, <laughs> we'll worry about that later. But um, you know, we were just luxury vehicles, and then we said, how about? you use an Uber app to get a, a taxi. And we're like, well, we don't know if that'll work, what it'll do for the brand. We, we created the Uber Garage, which is where we test things. So we did uh, Uber Taxi in, in Chicago. That was one of the first times we 
explored, and since then it's just been constant. And we're constantly trying to, the goal here is that everywhere you go, you push a button, and within three minutes you can get a ride. That's, that's everything I saw. I saw a quote, and I can't remember it, you'll remember it, from your CEO, right? Mm -hmm. He said it's nothing to do, he basically, his goal is to get rid or reduce private car ownership, right? He wants, yeah. he wants people to have less reason to own a car. Yeah, well, I mean, in San Francisco, when we got there, the, the tax industry was something like $200 million, but the private car industry, what everybody puts into their cars and their own driving is $20 billion. That's one city alone. Uh, I mean, so if